Andy Williams and Matthew Goodwin Freeman are standing by for hard hitting political debate. The political spa on talk. Political commentators, both Andy and Matthew, are with me. Uh, lots that has emerged over the last 24 hours about Chris Caba, a violent gangster who shot a rival in a nightclub a week before his death. There are people calling the police officer, uh, Sergeant Martin Blake, a hero who should not have been charged in the first place. Andy, what do you make of this? Well, I think it's a difficult one. I mean, with 2020 hindsight, it's easy to look at it and say this should never have happened, but... It's right that we have limits on police power in this country and have checks and balances in place to prevent those abuses of power that might occur. Now, clearly in this case, um, there was a jury trial. He was acquitted after, I think, three hours of deliberation. So we've obviously ended up in the right place. And, and perhaps some people, many people might think that what we've learned today uh, reinforces that. But what's really important is that we have a principle that juries in this country receive only information that's directly relevant to the trial and there's good reason why that information was kept from them. It's now a situation where Sergeant Martin Blake Andy is under police protection himself and he could face gross misconduct uh, investigations and perhaps even sanctions from his own, uh, well from the police and from the Independent Office of Police Conduct. Should that happen? Uh, I have to be honest, I don't know enough about the specifics of what the police might charge him with, with misconduct for. I mean, in terms of him being put under police protection, that's awful that he has to be in that position and nobody should have to uh, be in a place where they have to have to go under such sort of intensive measures to be kept, um, to be kept safe. Yeah. I think your caller made, your previous caller just now before the break made a really interesting point, which is, well, given that we know that this uh, gang exists and is committing crimes and is organised, is there something we could do about it? Now, again, that is very complicated. I, I think you're right, Peter, you, know, you can't simply go in and arrest everybody. But surely there has to be some way of tackling um, the problem of gangs in inner cities. Matthew, what do you make of what we've learned in the last 24 hours here? There was uh, certainly there were certainly a lot of people who were trying to tell us that Chris Cabo was a saint, a marvellous, wonderful person who was simply going about his business when an evil racist cop came and gunned him down. That is not what happened. We know the circumstances now. We The jury has come to this uh, verdict that Sergeant Martin Blake is innocent. Uh, what do you make of what we've learned in the last 24 hours, uh, Matthew? Well, I completely agree. He is a hero. Let's remember, Chris Caber was a violent gangster who shot one of his rivals in a nightclub the week beforehand and was part of a notorious gang running rampant across London. I, I agree with what Andy says, that we've got checks and balances in this country. That's great. That applies for everyone. But what happened when this started was that was thrown out the window and public pressure the pressure of social media took over. We've got to remember, we trust the police to run into danger when we run out of it. And I will always defend the police for doing their duty. Now, absolutely right. There are some rotten apples. There are some who do things bad and get found out and kicked out and removed and face justice for it. But he should not have been named right back at the start of this and now has to live in fear. Imagine what his family's gone through and now needing police protection as well. This has been an absolute disaster from the start and I hope sets how things shouldn't be done in the future. And they should Sar Sergeant Martin Blake have been named? No, I think that's a really fair point. It seemed, I, I don't see any good reason why he should have been. That's, you know, if he had he been anonymous, he wouldn't be under police protection now. So I agree with Matthew on that. Uh, let's talk about the uh, idea from the government that they have, of course, freed more prisoners today, some of them being very triumphant and tasteless in regard to their celebrations of their liberty. Uh, but there are many new ideas about house arrest to replace prison for low-level offenders. A big review is going to be undertaken by the former Lord Chancellor David Gawke. Matthew, what do you make of this? Will it work? Well, it's certainly an interesting idea. And, uh, you know, as long as the tags actually get on people and they are actually kept in their house, I have no problem with it. But the problem that I've got and so many others have 
is the fact that violent criminals are being released early in the first place. You know, no one voted for this. No one decided that this was what, you know, what they wanted in Britain in 2024. And I mean, the videos and scenes that we see of criminals being welcomed with champagne and Bentleys and Lamborghinis, it genuinely makes my blood boil. And then to read that number 10 and Keir Starmer share the public's anger, well, I'm sorry, you made that decision in the first place. You don't understand. Did they have any option? Did they have any option? Uh, Andy yeah, Williams, go ahead. Build more prisons. I mean, you can't well, do that overnight, can you, Andy Williams? Yeah, sorry. You, 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 I, I agree with you in the long term, absolutely. And Labour's going to build 14,000 prisons over the course of the parliament. The Conservative government said they were going to build 20,000 and only built six because they couldn't deliver on anything whatsoever and certainly not on prisons. Um, the reality is this Labour government were left between a rock and a hard place with no alternative but to release prisoners in two tranches. And, you know, you cannot build prisons overnight. I've seen some people say, oh, well, what about using the Bibby Stockholm or an equivalent of that? What about using hotels? Well, I don't know the ins and outs, but I suspect that hotels aren't secure enough to house prisoners. And I'm sure that's the case about prison, about sort of ships. and it may and well be the case about the Bibby and Stockholm and as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So it's it shouldn't be complicated because the last government should have built enough prisons and they didn't. And unfortunately, that is an open and shut case of a failed, probably more so than anything the Labour government's inherited. And we've heard a lot of Labour saying the Tories this, the Tories that. They've got a point in most cases. But on this, it is absolutely objectively clear it was a total cock up by the last government. Labour had no alternatives. By the way, they haven't been releasing violent prisoners. They haven't been releasing people who committed sexual offences. Yes, they've been releasing some people who we might consider to be undesirable, but I'm afraid... Quite a lot of those in prison. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to say, I mean, Andy is, is basically a Labour supporter. I am someone who used to work for the Conservative government. I worked in the Ministry of Justice for six months as a special advisor. He is absolutely right. The Conservatives failed to build prisons. They should have absolutely built prisons. We had lots of different announcements from Boris Johnson and others saying 20,000 more prison places and so on. That did not occur. And I mean, you don't honestly think, Matthew, that Keir Starmer really wants to release these people. No, I don't think he does. I don't think anyone wants to release these people. But the fact is that this was a decision he took. And there are alternatives. We talked about the Bibby Stockholm. You've talked about hotels. Why are both of those OK to house illegal immigrants coming to this country illegally, but not prisoners? We're because, spending because prisoners millions need to, no, no, Sorry, Matthew. Day. Sorry, Matthew. That doesn't make sense. Illegal immigrants need, well, illegal immigrants perhaps need somewhere to live and maybe that should be hotels, maybe it shouldn't be, that's another debate. But the point is that you want to keep prisoners securely, you're not keeping them securely if they're in hotels or in the baby Stockholm, what's and the point? Lock, lock the door, bar up the windows. We're shutting down hotels across this country where the British public and tourists can't use it because taxpayers' money is being spent putting illegal immigrants in it. I'm sorry, but there are alternatives. I, I just to don't think that makes any sense. Andy? I'm just glad Matthew's not running the NM MOJ and I'm glad he's nowhere near it because that's ludicrous. Um, it's one of the, one of the most... That, that, that I don't want just, Chris why, on why, the street. Why, why, do you, why do you assume that, that government is so straightforward I will just lock the doors of a hotel? I mean, come on. It's not, it's not a serious proposal. The last government built 500 prison places in total over 14 years. 500. And the prison population has doubled that. in the last 30 I'm not, years. I'm right? not defending that. Matthew, go ahead. I, I'm not defending that. I've come on this show many, many times and said, look, the Conservatives messed up. We messed up a lot of things. I'm not defending that at all. What I'm defending is the fact that no one voted to let prisoners out early. And there must be an alternative to letting prisoners out on our streets and then locking up people for Facebook tweets. Andy? I mean, that's, I mean firstly, that's just not how... I'm actually I'm 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 sick and tired of people of hearing people say nobody voted for this, nobody voted for that. That's actually not how general elections work. That's not how, not how representative democracies work. Um, we can't have a referendum on anything. I know that people on the right don't like that because they had one once and got the result they wanted, but that is not how things work. Um, I would love to hear a serious proposal from you or from anyone else around what we would do instead of releasing prisoners when. At one stage in August, there were fewer than 100 prison places left. So would you A, release people as Keir Starmer is doing, or would you B, just 
stop arresting people. There is no. I've already no said. Obviously. I've already said. Use the baby Stockholm. Use detention centres. Use so barracks. Been, use places like that. Don't you put prisoners you can't, out on the street. Uh, just, well, one at a time. One at a time. Matthew, go ahead. Well, as as I've said. Use the Bibby Stockholm, use detention centres, deport foreign criminals out of our prisons so that we free up spaces in the prisons to put prisoners in. The fact is, don't let prisoners out early. I'm sorry as well, Andy, you cannot say for a minute that that's not how elections work. Show me where in the Labour manifesto it said, we will let prisoners out early. Because if Labour had been honest with the public at the general election, so many people believe they would not have won. So I'm sorry, but you can try and say as much as you want that that's not how elections work. Okay. Labour were elected on a manifesto of change, and this is not the change the public wanted. I want to go to a break in a second, but first of all, I want to give Andy a reply to that. Uh, just briefly, I mean, I think Labour would have won the general election regardless of what they'd put in the manifesto. And actually, I was saying in the campaign... I was in favour of there being much more honest with people. I think they should have talked more openly about tax rises, which we need, et cetera, et cetera. Um, look, I think you can blame Labour for a not brilliant start on a number of fronts, but this is not one of them. They had no choice. Uh, our commentators about the sort of main uh, story politically today, which is about the health consultation. Some people would argue it's descended into farce with ridiculous uh, suggestions such as a weather spoons in every hospital. Um, I mean, I can certainly uh, get on board with that. Um, but uh, Keir Starmer is signalling the introduction of some measures such as supervised teeth brushing. Is this a good idea, Matthew? Well, I mean, we've got fantastic weather spoons in Hatch End, so I'll just get that in, in the first place. Um, I and my family are actually all teachers of prep school and pre-prep. We have seen teachers take on responsibilities and responsibilities of parents year after year after year. And this reminds me of that. You know, teachers having to bring in uh, toothbrushes at schools and now this coming in as nanny statement. I I'm sorry, but where's personal responsibility gone to? You know, brushing the teeth of your child is the job of a parent. It's not the job of the state. It's not the so job the, of the but NHS. But if the, but if the, the parent... The OK, I, I, I completely agree with you on that, Matthew. It is the job of the parent to teach them, the parents to take responsibility. But if they don't take that responsibility and a teacher can see what's happening, maybe they should, maybe they should say, or at least have the opportunity, to say, let's all brush together. Even the little kids who know how to brush, that's all fine. Show your friends how to do it. This is what you should be doing. Maybe that's a responsible course of action. But that would be a teacher deciding to do this as a one-off, not putting it in as part of a curriculum or part of a job description, because very quickly it will become kids being put at the doorstep of a school, nappies not changed. We've seen it before. Well, we, 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 we know that brushed. we know that a quarter. Answer, you know, all these sorts of it's a decent point, being Matthew. Passed off to okay. The, the and uh, Andy, it's a decent point. I mean, the nappies point is a is one in that recently there was uh, evidence that one in four children who are aged five come to school not properly toilet trained. And obviously, there there are some people who you know there are some children who who find it very very difficult. But you would imagine at the age of five that that would be something that most parents not there aren't twenty five percent of parents who can't do that. There's got to be some extra element here with toothbrushing as well in schools. Do you support that, Andy? I mean, I agree with what with what you said, Peter, initially. I mean, I can't imagine this is something that's going to be rolled out nationwide in every single school for every single child. It seems to me that it would be a backup option that would be available if needed. One other one adjacent point I would make is that we have a dentistry, a dental system in Britain in crisis yeah. where you can't get an appointment where um, our nation's teeth are in a tremendously bad state. And part of that is because the basics aren't being done. So if there's anything that can be done to, you know, from a young age, give kids the tools they need to um, sort out their teeth, sort out their oral hygiene, I mean, that's some, it can develop into cancer as well. So, that, you know, there's a serious point I, I, to make, I take your point actually, on that, Andy. It's actually an overlooked, I think it's a really overlooked area of the nation's public health. Keir Starmer, uh, Matthew, saying that actually, you know, this will keep kids out of hospital. This will ensure that uh, the main reason that young kids go to hospital is, between six and ten, I think, is to have uh, teeth removed. And actually, maybe this preventative measure might be a good idea. Yeah, look, I've got no problem with anything to make 
people healthier. I, I've got no problem with that. You know, I'm a conservative who supports the smoke-free generation uh, plans. Mm -hmm. The point is the rolling it out across the, the, the country. If that's the plan, which we don't know yet, but if that's the plan, I would strongly object to it because it is not the job of a teacher. It's the job of a parent. And if a parent can't take responsibility for the kid that they brought into this world, they should have thought about that in the first place. What about the kids, Matthew? Which should the kids suffer then? Well, I, I said I'm absolutely fine with the teacher doing it as one-off. I'm absolutely fine with the teacher being supported to have a word with the parents and say, look, you sent your kid in today, no teeth brushed, nappy full, that's not acceptable, and I will report you if you don't sort it out. Because the teacher should not be picking up the job from the parent because that's a slippery slope. Andy, final thought on this? Look, I, I obviously think we should be concerned about teachers having to go to those sorts of lengths to do the job of parents. I do think that. But equally, we shouldn't be letting children suffer. And, and teachers have an important role, and schools have an important role to play in our communities. I'm afraid sometimes they might have to pick up the slack. I want to ask you about a final question. He's been uh, one of the UK's favourite and indeed most prominent refugees for two thirds of a century. But uh, Paddington Bear, whose official name is, of course, Paddington Brown, has been granted a British passport. This is the co-producer of the latest Paddington film. He said the Home Office had issued the specimen document to the fictional Peruvian board, bo born character, listing for completeness the official observation that he is, in fact, a bear. Uh, now then, uh, what do you think about this, Andy Williams? Would you share your marmalade sandwich with Yvette Cooper or give her a hard stare? <laughs> I don't know what to say to that, Peter. Um, <laughs> I mean, firstly, I think I, I feel sorry for Paddington because he's been overtaken by Mo Farah as uh, Britain's favourite refugee, I think. Um, but... Yeah, no, nice of them to give him, a, give him a passport. I hope it makes him feel very at home here. Um, uh, Matthew Goodwin-Freeman, uh, what do you make of this? Waste of taxpayers' money or something that we could just perhaps shrug our shoulders and say, actually, we all love a bit of Paddington? I mean, look, I loved the scene with Paddington and the late Queen. It brought a tear to my eye and I'm sure many across the country. It's a nice idea. I'm just wondering how many people he skipped the queue and whether there's something in return to, to help the Labour Party. It, it, I don't know. It, it's a specimen document. I don't think he can actually go through border control with it. <laughs> you never know. We'll, we'll have to see what stamps he gets and where he goes to visit next. Well, I think, I think Paddington in Peru is uh, perhaps the next uh, <laughs> film. Have, have you seen the films, guys? I haven't. I should put it on the list. Oh, you've got you've got to. The second one is actually better than the first one. It's sort of Hugh Grant absolutely sort of mocking himself. It's it's a really, really good one. There's some very well-observed humour in all of that. Thank you both very much indeed, Andy Williams there uh, and Matthew Goodwin-Freeman, political commentators both, and Matthew is also a Conservative councillor as well. So thank you to them.